Good morning and a very warm welcome to the 19th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. Can I remind everyone to present and to turn their present to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. Um, could I declare a public interest declaration of interest in that I am the Vice Chair of CERC and also a member of the British Computer Society. Um, can I welcome the panel this morning and Agenda item one. Sorry, my apologies. Agenda item one is decision taking business in private, uh, and that's discussion of the evidence that we will hear today. Are members content to take that in private? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two. Uh, and can we take um, evidence on the inquiry in private and future meetings? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is a uh, STEM in the early years inquiry and I would like to welcome to committee this morning um, Susan Boyd, primary, primary teacher, Elizabeth Kelly, principal teacher, Andrew Bruce, deputy director of the learning director of the Scottish Government, Ian Menzies, senior education officer, sciences, learning, education, Scotland, and Edim Wood, Emma Woodham, STEM Learning Manager of Glasgow Science Centre and a very warm welcome to you all this morning uh, and I'd like to open by just asking you to give a brief outline of your experience in this area and if you feel um, it would be really good to, to have a good example of STEM innovation. So um, perhaps um, Elizabeth would you be willing to start with that? Sure. So my name is Elizabeth Kelly. I'm a principal teacher for early years in Midlothian Council. So my job role is primarily to support, um, challenge and help improve all our ELCs, so our early learning and childcare centres in Midlothian Council, state run and also our funded providers. So that's my job role. Um, my interest in STEM is because I'm interested in all early years and we have a very holistic approach to the curriculum in early years. And also personally, I'm studying for my master's at Edinburgh in learning for sustainability. Um, STEM in early years, there is a massive opportunity to really engage the children when they're young in STEM because they are already totally interested in their world and how it works and why things work and all that kind of thing. And it's helping our staff be able to capture that, to understand it so that they can scaffold the learning and progress that in those early years. Thank you. Uh, Ms Boyd? Uh, hello, uh, I'm Susan Boyd and I'm uh, currently a primary teacher at Bredalbin Academy in Aberfeldy, uh, but I have over 40 years experience of working with children and was formerly a principal teacher of early years in Highland. Uh, I've studied uh, science at St Andrews University and I got into primary teaching specifically to promote science and greater and quality uh, uh, experiences within early years in primary and, uh, um, and I am really pleased to be able to report I've seen a lot of wonderful practice particularly in the early years um, when I was in Highland I had the opportunity to support uh, a small cluster of nurseries uh, there was 33 uh, principal teachers it was a, a, a new uh, um, a program that Highland rolled out uh, and had for five years until sadly budgetary cuts changed that perspective and in that five years we did what I consider to be absolutely essential support of early years practitioners who are not qualified teachers and have very variable experiences in science technology engineering and maths uh, I had the real fortune to work with a range of practitioners to develop the Highland Science Programme, which is now available on GLOW and is a really big tool in supporting uh, from early years through to second level. My current work over the last four years with Bedalbin Academy has involved us trying to develop a STEM hub within our community school. Um, and this has been particularly successful. We were finalists in the Education Scotland STEM Awards last year, and we're promoting the development of STEM through STEM ambassadors from the secondary, through STEM prefects in the primary, and through developing practitioner knowledge from early years right through the primary into secondary by having STEM drop-ins. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. 
Good morning, thank you. Um, I, my name is Dr Emma Reedham. I'm the STEM Learning Manager at Glasgow Science Centre. My role involves managing our multifaceted learning team um, and we're really passionate at Glasgow Science Centre that learning is for all and we want to inspire and challenge everybody to discover the world around them and the relevance of science in their own lives. Um, previous to this, I was a research scientist, um, and today I'd like to highlight um, our experience at Glasgow Science Centre in providing training um, for teachers uh, in, the, in our Inspire and Challenge philosophy, which encourages teachers become, to become facilitators uh, and to develop the natural curiosity inside their pupils to build pupils as scientists rather than vessels of knowledge. We're really passionate about equity of access at Glasgow Science Centre. I'd also can highlight a number of initiatives that we've been using to ensure that we reach far and wide throughout Scotland, for everywhere from Orkney down to Dumfries and Galway, uh, to ensure that we're reaching those most in need, uh, including our local areas who are experiencing the highest levels of deprivation. Thank you. Mr Menzies. Uh, good morning. My name is Ian Menzies. I'm a Senior Education Officer at Education Scotland. Uh, I lead on the Sciences Curriculum, also lead on Learning for Sustainability. And I'm also responsible for the implementation of the STEM strategy at Education Scotland. Uh, I was on the Scottish Government Working Group that developed a STEM strategy and oversee the new uh, STEM team, Education Scotland. I think one of the biggest pieces of work we've done over recent years is the Raising Aspirations in Science Education programme. So this was a three-year pilot with the Wood Foundation, with the Scottish Government and also with participating local authorities. We've been working with the local authorities up to now and we've extended our programme to a further four. Uh, we just received the final evaluation last week, which was extremely positive. It showed that the programme had helped to uh, increase the confidence of teachers. 71% of teachers said they'd reported an increase in their confidence in relation to the pedagogy around STEM. And 76% also said that their confidence had increased in relation to the content of science and delivering the content of science. So as a result of that positive evaluation last week, uh, the programme is now to be offered to all local authorities around Scotland on a rolling basis. Another big piece of work we've been involved in is the Improving Gender Balance and Equalities programme that I also oversee. This was a pilot programme started with Institute of Physics and Skills Development Scotland uh, three years ago, uh, really trying to tackle the um, ingrained gender imbalance within STEM subjects at school. Uh, again, that's been really positively evaluated and we're just in the process of extending that to schools and clusters around Scotland uh, with the support of a new team. Thank you very much. And Mr Bruce? Good morning. Uh, my name is Andy Bruce. I'm a civil servant in the Learning Directorate at Scottish Government and the division I lead was responsible both for um, developing the original strategy and now for overseeing its delivery. Um, really great to hear about the practice that we're hearing from colleagues around the table about what's happening um, out in schools and early learning centres um, just now. I suppose the things I'll focus on from the, the government point of view are the arrangements we put in place to, to support the strategy at a national level. Um, so along with putting the various governance arrangements in place to oversee delivery, I suppose a key thing that I'd identify is the introduction of the new STEM bursaries um, to support um, career changes into teaching profession in those particular um, subjects where there are particular shortages. And in the last year we had 107 of those bursaries um, and the scheme will open again um, for the forthcoming year shortly. Thank you very much. Um, it's quite a big panel this morning, so if you do want to respond to any of the questions of the committee, please just indicate to myself or the clerks, and we'll try and ensure that everybody um, gets an opportunity. Um, and on that note, I'm going to move to our first question from Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, Mr Menzies, I wonder if I could ask you about the overall strategy uh, towards the STEM subjects from Education Scotland. And uh, you've pinpointed some areas of what you consider to be good work that's being undertaken. Could you just uh, outline a little bit more about what you see as the key points within that strategy to try to address some of the concerns that obviously we've been presented with through our evidence? Sure, I think uh, one of the big features within the STEM strategy is teacher confidence. Actually, we've heard that from some of our other panel already. And Education Scotland is playing a, re a leading role in terms of professional learning and building that teacher confidence in the system. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have just published last week is we've undertaken a practitioner survey and also a provider survey looking at uh, the provision of STEM professional learning around Scotland. And what that shows is that 43% um, of the respondents from early learning and childcare uh, agree or strongly agree that they're confident in delivering STEM. 
and that compares with 63% uh, of primary respondents. So we know we've got a big piece of work to do to um, build on those confidence levels. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that the RAISE programme has been a big part of our work over the last three years to do that. Uh, and we're really excited to be in a position to extend that programme to authorities around Scotland. Mm -hmm. Uh, in partnership with the Wood Foundation. We're really grateful to the Wood Foundation, obviously, for the financial support they've given to that programme, over a million pounds to date. Uh, but another big piece of work, again, that we've been doing is we launched a new grants programme last year, last October, uh, and we issued £187,000 to 24 organisations around Scotland. And the real focus of that grants programme was to extend provision to practitioners around Scotland to ensure equity of access. Uh, and also to develop new models, new approaches, and to find ways that we can scale up existing provision which should prove successful. It was a big week for us last week in Education Scotland because we also launched a second round of that grants programme, and we now have a budget of £1.3 million, which is really exciting. Uh, our new STEM team are busy working with local authorities just now around Scotland and with uh, school clusters to encourage them to bid for that money. That money is for the STEM strategy, but it's also for making maths count because we realise that mathematics and numeracy are a big core part of STEM uh, as well, so we're really keen to have a focus on maths and numeracy within that. We know particularly we've got work to do in terms of building confidence in technologies and engineering, and we've identified them as priority areas for the grants this year uh, as well. And in addition to that £1.3 million we announced last week, we're also this week um, starting to distribute a further £500,000 worth of funding to those organisations that bid for the funding last year. And so the whole idea is that year on year we want a growth within the provision of professional learning and within the STEM strategy. So the 24 organisations, for instance, they uh, received funding last year. And most of those organisations are going to continue to extend and develop that support into this year. And our £500,000 is to, to support that work. So, Thank you. I, I'm, I'm sure all of that is uh, immensely encouraging. Uh, can I just draw your attention to some of the... Um, uh, comments that have been made um, by uh, STEM uh, professionals here. We've had Elizabeth Kelly, Juliet Robertson, Dr. Kersey, Ross, who've made the point that they feel that there's quite a lot of practitioners who have a poor understanding of, of certain concepts. Um, and also they, they feel, um, in uh, Dr. Kirsty Ross's case, that they feel that actually sometimes uh, when they have that poor understanding, they're actually not aware of that. Um, so can I ask, what, what conversations are you having with the uh, General Teaching Council of Scotland and also with the uh, university training schools? Because it seems to me that some of these are issues about teacher training. Yes, I mean, obviously there's, there's opportunities within teacher training to promote that confidence. You know, but, you know, for us, it's that whole journey of a, a professional, really. So from the moment they qualify as a teacher, uh, providing probationer support, and that's something that RAISE officers have been doing uh, very practically within local authorities. Uh, and also uh, those early career uh, teachers as well, building that confidence from the word go. But recognising too, there's been people that have been teaching for a number of years and they still need that uh, type of support. So our RAISE officers have been embedded within local authorities, working through all those different processes, those different opportunities, uh, providing that support. Uh, sometimes that support is delivered through uh, separate training sessions. But we know sometimes there's challenges around teachers being released from the classroom. So raise officers have actually been going into classrooms, doing team teaching alongside uh, these officers. So could I just ask on that theme whether there are specific issues that are being raised by teacher training colleges, by the GTCS, uh, about is it, is it a problem about the knowledge uh, that is being taught within uh, these courses, or is it more about having the confidence and the actual skills of teaching? What, what do you feel is being flagged up as the main area of concern? Um, I think the issue is really just about the background in science and the experience of science as people go into uh, so teacher training, if you like. So there is a big uh, job to be done. I think initial teacher education has got uh, an opportunity to address that, but they've got very limited time with those students, if you like. Uh, and so I think a big part of the challenge is to, you know, to build on that. To give you an example from our grants programme, um, one of the grantees from last year, um, from the first round of funds, was in New College Lanarkshire. Uh, and they realised that uh, the early learning and childcare practitioners that they were, they were training had a lack of confidence within STEM. So through the funding they've received from us, what they've done is they've developed a new STEM module, uh, and that is being provided to those early learning and childcare practitioners as part of the training programme to build their confidence. I think the college actually realised they've got a big engineering provision within the college, an early years provision, and they're trying to join it up much more effectively. Uh, you know, across the college. But also those early years practitioners are taking that uh, through the course of this year, will be taking that learning in STEM 
into the establishments that are going to visit in terms of their placements. So that's just one of the things that we're doing to the grants programme to try to get that early career support in place, to build that confidence and to actually uh, really take that into the okay. system. I've just got one final question. And this is Miss oh, sorry. Kayla wants to come in on that. Apologies. Point oh, just before we oh, move on. Oh, only to say that most of the practitioners that we work with in our early learning in Chaka don't go through the initial teacher education programme. They're coming from many other avenues because they're not teachers. So there's very few authorities left that have actual teachers within early learning and childcare. There are some, but there's a majority um, of authorities now where the staff, and even with teachers in, the majority of the staff in those settings are early learning practitioners, and they come through HNCs, HNDs, BA childhood practice if they're at graduate level. They, some of them have SVQ3s. And within all that structure, there's a very, very wide range of uh, courses that are um, presented. So most from the research I've done, but it's been anecdotal and asking people, they have very, very limited STEM input into those courses. Okay, thank so you. That was just a uh, thank you. My, my last question was to uh, Susan Boyd, if I may. Um, we had a comment um, a couple of years ago, but more recently from the Royal Society of Chemistry that they would like to see a dedicated science uh, professional in every primary school. Would you care to comment on that view? Well, I think that would be lovely, and I personally would totally welcome that. But I think what, you know, what we really need is that I, I'm, I'm really happy to hear about all the development work, particularly development work for early years practitioners who can actually come into the job with actually no qualification as such and are doing SVQs on, on the hop. And, you know, my experience in Highland, I know I'm deviating slightly from uh, what you've asked me about, but it does relate, hopefully, um, is that these people are, were supported by principal teachers. And these were people that had a, a depth and breadth of knowledge of the curriculum and appro approaches to learning and teaching at, at early, right through early level into primary. And uh, this is actually the only way forward from my perspective. It worked, it was successful. Um, and I think that in a primary context, I'm very fortunate to work in a community school because I have access to secondary science, technology, engineering, math specialists, and that's invaluable. But I think that uh, uh, small primary schools should have access to uh, a STEM practitioner um, that has the relevant qualifications and experience to support practice. And that was the hugely valuable thing that I was involved in uh, in Highland, was that we could deliver STEM training uh, centrally in Inverness or, or, or uh, in Sky for, for Sky and Lech Haber. We could deliver it, but the most important fact was that we were then able to go into those early years centres mm. and schools and back that up to, uh, uh, with resources, uh, with team teaching, and to support uh, uh, practitioners who were either teachers or most usually who were early years practitioners. Thank you. And uh, bring in Mr. Greer. Um, I'd like to come back. Ian mentioned um, some of the survey results about the confidence of, of practitioners. I think it was roughly 43% of early years practitioners have a level of confidence, roughly 63% of, of primary teachers in STEM. Some of the written submissions that we received on that were quite interesting. Um, they made the point that STEM in and of itself is quite a broad area, and you would expect a substantial majority of primary teachers, we hope, to have a level of confidence in their ability to teach maths and numeracy. But in something like engineering, it's, it's quite different. Does Education Scotland or, or perhaps the government have any stats that break that down beyond STEM into individual subjects at primary teaching level? Uh, we do, and I, th I think that's been you know, one of the reasons why we've taken forward that piece of work around the annual STEM practitioner survey uh, and also the provider survey, and we just published those results last week on our National Improvement Hub. So to give you the figures, um, in terms of early learning and childcare, uh, what early learning and childcare practitioners have told us is that one of their top priorities continues to be mathematics and numeracy. So 33.8% of them said that that was one of their priority areas. You can compare that with 20% that said science was a priority for this coming year, and 20% for technologies. Uh, for primary, it's slightly different. 34% said that their priority was in mathematics and numeracy. Uh, they were a bit more confident in science, 23, 24% uh, said that that was a priority area, but technologies was 28%. So again, our experience, you know, in the results from the surveys, but also from inspection, shows us quite clearly that the technology side 
is an area that needs more support, engineering especially, uh, but also we've still got work to do in terms of mathematics and numeracy. And that's why with the grants programme that we just launched, the second round that we launched last week, there continues to be an extremely strong focus on mathematics and numeracy. Thank you. I'm interested in, in the balance then between um, initial teacher education and continuous development. Now, um, I accept, obviously, we've just been talking about early years practitioners who take a different route into this, but to look at just primary teachers for a moment here, um, in a range of inquiries this committee has done, we've uh, came across a range of areas in which people feel very strong and there should be more of this in initial teacher education. And it would be a very good idea for there to be more of all of it in initial teacher education, but that's just not possible. So I'm interested in your thoughts on what is absolutely essential, what is core, so core to STEM teaching at primary level that it has to be an ITE, um, and what, I say, can wait until uh, CPD is probably the, the wrong phrase, um, but what is essential and thus has to be an ITE because it can't realistically all be there when you're not a subject specialist? Uh, well, again, the, you know, the value of the data coming from the, the, the STEM service is really important here. You know, by a long shot, one of the things that teachers have told us is their top priority across all sectors is about the pedagogy uh, of teaching uh, STEM. Uh, that was you know, quite a significant front runner. Second to that was the skills progression. You know, we know for, for uh, STEM careers and for STEM pathways, there's a really important focus on skills. And teachers are telling us quite clearly they want a strong focus on that. Uh, I think another big area is around just the general knowledge of what's available and resources. You do have a quite a limited time within initial teacher education to provide that support and learning to uh, you know, teachers that are sort of coming into the system. But a really important part of that support we can give them is to connect them to the really fabulous support from the science centres, from festivals, from other STEM partners. We have a really rich, rich landscape in Scotland uh, around that. So again, just making sure that these sort of newly qualified teachers or training teachers are really connected to that sort of wider landscape and that infrastructure, I think, is really key so they can continue to progress and develop once they qualify. Susan, I'd be interested in your perspective on that balance between what, if, if, if you've seen certainly over the last few decades, any change in that, in the balance between what is covered in IT and what has to be covered later into career and whether that balance is being struck right? Well, my experience is that there's a lot of, of IT going on, at, at, you know, down in, in the early years centres as well. And uh, the school that I'm in at the moment is that, uh, you know, we, we, in our survey, we've identified things that we would like to be improved. But, you know, we're using IT, I think, really well. I think that uh, uh, the problem is the access to uh, uh, professional skills and knowledge. If you're in a rural area, that can sometimes be a problem accessing training. I know myself, and I, I love using IT, but, you know, I, I, it's very difficult for me to go on training courses. And if you're not using it, you're losing it. Thanks. And just one final question, Camille, thank you. Um, for Elizabeth, around early years practitioners, um, I, again, thinking of, of balance here, I'm wondering how much emphasis do you think we should be putting on equipping early years practitioners with these skills as opposed to ensuring that there are subject specialists, whether it's teachers or industry professionals who are involved in the early years setting alongside those practitioners? <clears throat> I think it's probably a mixture of both, but the earliest practitioners themselves are the people on the ground every day with the children. They're the ones that are skilled in observing what is happening with children, seeing what learning has taken place and building on that. So we can have specialists that go in and, and people like me that go in and, and help and train and, and model and coach and teach, but they really... When you, when you walk away, we need to have left them with those skills in some way. So whether they come through their initial training or we build on them in the setting, and I think it would have to be a bit of both, because from my own experience of, of teacher training, you can learn everything in the world, but then you're on the job, and phew, unless you, you're continually refreshing and improving, you know, five years down the line, you've forgotten that bit, and, you, you know, and priorities change, and that's what's difficult in, in teaching. In the minute, there's a huge focus on literacy and numeracy, so in people's heads, everything else shifts a wee bit away. Um, did that answer your question? I think Hello. so, yeah. yeah it's a book, I yeah, think. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Ms Lamont? Um, thank you very much. I think my question is probably mostly for Education Scotland and the Scottish Government, specifically around how realistically this can be um, delivered on the ground in, in you know, kind of a theoretical model, but what's actually happening in our communities around resources. And you might be aware that 
um, in response to concerns raised about the level of resources for science in school. The Learning Societies Group investigated the funding of science practical equipment, and their study found that more than half of respondents felt they did not have sufficient equipment and consumables to deliver practical science work. Um, others noted a lack of training on use of science equipment and consumables, and most, 98% of respondents, reported having to draw on additional funding for practical activities, with parental sources the most common for extracurricular activity. Now, obviously, this would be even more serious, I suspect, in early years rather than secondary school, where there's at least some um, infrastructure. But I wonder if you have any analysis of availability of resources, support staff in early years, um, and have you done any research into the extent to which this has been funded through external resources, it says, um, and parents, because that in itself must create or amplify disadvantage. And I wonder if there's been work done in that. The, um, in terms of uh, resources, I think the point to make at early learning and childcare is this is very much about STEM in the everyday. So it's about observing STEM in nature, you know, walking in your local park, your, uh, your setting grounds, for instance, observing uh, biodiversity, observing the changing of the seasons, uh, you know, just um, enjoying your senses and understanding about your senses. So, you know, in early years, in early learning and childcare provision in, in, in lower primary, there's not a big need for very expensive resources to support STEM. Uh, I think one of the things that RAISE team uh, have been doing uh, really successfully is working with schools, visiting schools and settings and early learning childcare settings as well, and looking at the resources that they already have. You know, quite often, you know, in many settings, they have uh, sort of big kit boxes for science and STEM that, you know, maybe people have forgotten about. And so part of the training our RAISE officers have been doing is taking those boxes out, looking at the consumables, for instance, they might need, providing training on those boxes, uh, getting those boxes back in shape to make sure the primary schools have got... Uh, the support they need. A uh, RAISE officer in Murray, for instance, um, made sure that every primary school in Murray had a basic kit for teaching sort of science and STEM uh, up there. So, uh, and one of the other sort of pieces of support a RAISE team have been providing is just there are different organisations across Scotland, across the UK, they provide funding for resources. So, our RAISE officers have been providing uh, training to different settings and to practitioners to point them in the direction of the funding resources that are already available, you know, and, and uh, allowing them to access them. But would you accept that even accessing those resources requires support? It requires resource within a, 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 an early learning or primary school setting for somebody to do that job. And just to repeat the point, that the, the funding established, there was an issue about science, practical uh, equipment. There was an issue about um, the training and the use of anything like that, and that it was being resourced largely by parents. Do you think there's an equality issue here? Uh, well, again, that's the support our RAISE officers are providing locally, you know, and they're um, embedded within local authorities, you know, they're targeting different communities, uh, they may be in more need of support, and that's part of the work that they're doing locally, uh, and they're providing that training for those settings to access the funding that's available. They're saying, that they're saying there's not the training, they're saying there's an issue about training, mm -hmm. there's an issue about equipment, there's an issue about training, and the third one, which I did have concerns <coughs> about, that it requires external resource, which is disproportionately parental resource, which means that disadvantage is going to be amplified. Is this something that Education Scotland or the Scottish Government is looking at? Well, in terms of the resourcing for science, it, it, that's really the responsibility of so, local authorities, for instance, in their schools and establishments. But would you be, well, if, if you were doing an inspection, would you have a view on what the resource should be? Um, during the inspection process, if there was an issue around the resourcing, then that would, I suppose, be brought up in dialogue with those establishments. Uh, Do you accept this survey is flagging up an issue... Do you, or do you, is it the responsibility of Education Scotland to respond to this survey or is it somebody else's responsibility? Local authorities have the lead responsibility in terms of resourcing the curriculum and resourcing the schools and yes, settings. Does the Scottish Government have a responsibility in dialogue with local authorities? Well, I think we still have a responsibility to respond to various um, research and report that's coming forward. I don't have additional insight that I can give you into how we've taken forward those particular things other than to pick up the points that Ian's mentioned around the significant investment we put into additional um, support for practitioners in, in training areas. But I certainly agree that as we take the um, strategy forward, we want to be keeping alive to anything that's potentially getting in the way of successful implementation of it. But would you think that a strategy without the resources underpinning it is not really a strategy at all? Well, I think there has been significant resource that has gone into supporting the strategy. So Ian's alluded to earlier on the additional support so for... 
Sorry to interrupt you. Does that mean you don't accept the findings of the Learning Societies Group on uh, this issue? So I'm not saying I don't accept um, the findings. I haven't studied them in detail, I, I must admit, um, and I certainly would be prepared for myself and indeed um, the infrastructure that's around supporting the implementation of strategy to look at that um, in more detail. But I suppose I don't accept the point that there hasn't been additional resource that's gone into supporting the strategy. It's gone into areas around professional support. It's gone into areas such as um, STEM bursaries. The question is whether it's sufficient, I suppose, but it'd be very useful if you were able to come back um, having looked at the, the findings. Mr Gray. Surely the question was about support for technicians and equipment, the additional resources that you've talked to about are about supporting teachers and training. So are you saying there's been resources going at the, the learned society's concern that Ms Lam is raising was about lack of technicians and equipment in order to carry out empirical science. Mm. So are you saying that additional resources have put in to support that? Because the examples you've given aren't supporting that, they're supporting something else. So the point I make is the supply of technicians is a local authority matter and how they choose to um, deploy their resource in education. The point I was making about CLPL is that um, resource is available to a full range of practitioners. So we've spoken about um, teaching professionals, we've spoken about early years practitioners. It also includes technicians who are able to um, access that support through CERC and indeed through some of the other work that education's got on about line this morning as well. I think another point to make here is obviously the Scottish Government are providing significant uh, funding to CERC, you know, over £100,000 of funding this year. Uh, so CERC as part of their training would also provide uh, kits and resources as an embedded part of that professional learning. So, um, you know, they come to CERC, they get that training and the support. They can come to CERC physically, but CERC also run very good uh, online cook-along sessions where professional learning is delivered uh, virtually uh, through GLOW and other forms. And when they do the training, those kit boxes and those resources are sent to establishments ahead of that sort of virtual cook-along session. So again, through the Scottish Government support for CERC, we're helping to provide that resource into the system. The training that I was talking about wasn't necessarily training in terms of confidence in science. Uh, just last week, for instance, we provide training to a raise officer team and 12 local authorities about how to access funding and about all the different funding sources that are available so they can provide that support. Uh, to uh, settings within their local authorities. So our focus is very much on professional learning for practitioners, also for technicians, uh, and the so local authorities so is very much about the You're, you're the providing funding for somebody to learn how to access funding? Um, we're and providing training. And yeah. delivering um, training, rather than it's been core, the core business of the education system. Well, that's and a you're responsibility at the mercy of, of whether authorities. somebody within the system. I suppose what we're looking at is how you can be systematic in your approaches, rather than being at the mercy of individuals within individual established who happen to have an interest already. But how do you make it consistent if you're actually accepting that it's all about getting access to this or looking to that group or whatever? How do you make that consistent in a school which is under perhaps more pressure or an early learning centre that's under more pressure than other centres? Um, I just wanted to, to, to say that my personal experience in three local authorities is that uh, it's down to head teachers uh, to uh, decide on what part of the budget uh, they're identifying for, uh, for STEM resources. And as we all know, budgets are under pressure, but I haven't found that to be the major factor in uh, uh, inconsistency of delivery of STEM. It's more about the expertise that you know I, I personally have found the experience of a deficit in. Thank you. Um, can I just ask a quick supplementary, um, because it has been raised um, in articles in the test about the importance of technicians, um, not least of which because they usually carry the health and safety um, uh, for, for any science experiments that are taking place. At what point would Education Scotland, would that only be identified as an issue at an inspection, at what point would Education Scotland make an intervention to say that the support wasn't enough to support the curriculum? Well, in terms of technicians, obviously they're mainly based within um, secondary settings. I mean, we're talking about obviously early learning and primary today. But one of the things we've done quite strongly within the STEM strategy, and I'm really pleased about this, is that we have a focus not just in early learning practitioners and primary 
practitioners, but also in school-based technical support staff. So, for instance, within our grants programme last year, we provided funding to CERC and the Scottish Technicians Advisory Council to provide opportunities for professional learning and development for technicians. Uh, that funding and that support will continue into this second phase this year uh, as well. And I think one of the opportunities we've got here, and this is something that you know, we can explore further as we, as we go, and a really nice um, or highly effective cluster model where you have the early learning settings, the primary settings and the secondary settings all working very strongly collegiately and collaboratively. I suppose one of the things for us to explore is how the, uh, the technicians can provide support and resources uh, for the whole cluster, for early learning in primary uh, settings as well. And actually, in terms of the resourcing aspect, that's one of the things we're seeing in some clusters already is where they're sharing resources, where a primary school doesn't have access to resources. Quite often, the secondary school is prepared to, you know, to provide that and support with their technicians. So these are all things that we're hoping to grow and develop through that sort of cluster approach uh, that we've got a very strong focus on within the grants programme. Thank you. Uh, can I bring in Dr Allen? Um, thanks very much. Um, I was interested uh, in how um, uh, Dr. Wyram opened uh, talking about the importance of uh, uh, overcoming some of the challenges that geography and, and other uh, limiting factors place on, on young people's access to science. So I'm just curious to hear from, from all of you what uh, you feel those obstacles are and whether they, they correspond with <laughs> everything that's been listed as a, as a potential obstacle in the way of, of, uh, of young people accessing STEM. further on that. <clears throat> um, so uh, it's an exciting time uh, at Glasgow Science Centre just now in that we're um, uh, due to a 4.1 uh, million investment from the Wellcome Trust. We're able to embark on what we're calling the Connect Project, which is uh, a large scale organisational change for us to be able to support and attract a more diverse audience. And as part of that, we've been really looking uh, in depth as to what the barriers are for, for th those who wish to access us. Um, and it's really about those who partially see us as being relevant to their lives, um, whether they are, uh, do, are financially able to visit us. Um, and it's about making what we do relevant to them. But also uh, in terms of where we are at the Science Centre in Govan, um, we are surrounded by those experiencing really the highest levels of deprivation. And in those cases, um, entrance costs and transport barriers are, are a huge issue. So I would say that there's a, a range of issues in terms of people not accessing us. Um, and they're not, they're not all financial. And uh, we, over the next uh, three years, um, during the, spend, uh, the, the um, spending period of that funding, we'll be looking to address those and it will be over the next 10 years to see this period of organisational change. Um, in terms of um, ensuring that we are overcoming those barriers, um, we are able to use uh, really a, a, a great blend of different options. For example, our, our transport grants um, that we allocate over the last um, academic year, we've been um, We've been allocating our transport grant to those in the highest 40% SIMD areas as well as those in areas five and six on the urban and rural scale. Um, also, all additional support schools um, are eligible for transport grants, uh, three per school. Um, we also uh, are, find it extremely important to invest in and make partnerships with local educational authorities to ensure that the uh, pupils that are experiencing the highest levels of deprivation in, in those areas are able to access. And on that front, we have um, long-term fruitful partnerships with Glasgow City Council and Western Bartonshire. And we really see the benefits of, of those partnerships in that we see 43% of Glasgow schools visit at least once per year and 28% of Western Bartonshire schools visiting once per year as well. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that all, uh, of our non-visitors, half of those are higher, uh, they are uh, above 40% SIMD. So again, it highlights that it's not, they're not just financial barriers for people that are coming to visit us. Um, in terms of um, remote and, and rural and difficult to access, um, we're able to offer an on-tour visit. Um, and this can be a great option for those who aren't able to visit. And people are, are frankly astonished at the lengths that we are willing to go to at Glasgow Science Centre to visit schools. And um, we, are, um, we have received funding from the Adena Trust. So over the next three years, we will be visiting every um, island-based remote primary school in Scotland. So uh, over the last year, we have visited Orkney and we visited Skye. Um, and over the next two years, we will continue to do so. And we're planning a Shetland tour. Um, 
we are about, or we have just seen our one millionth uh, visitor as part of our on-tour team, which we're very proud of. And um, we always uh, keep in mind when we are uh, designing exhibitions and programmes and experiences, how we can take these on the road and ensure that they, these experiences um, are, are getting to um, those who are not able to access, access us. As somebody from who went to school up in Inverness, I do really, I really feel passionately that we are getting up there and uh, inspiring uh, the children in, in those schools um, to come and take part and maybe work there one day like I have. Um, so I think we're very proud of our on tour funding and we've really worked hard to leverage third party funding to make that happen. We've received uh, 2.5 uh, 2 million from GlaxoSmithKline um, and also funding from the Scottish Government Energy and Climate Change Director, Directorate and OPITO as well to build the, those exhibits. Um, so that's really go, uh, we go about um, reaching those who, who can't visit us. On, you mentioned those who can't visit you, but presumably mm -hmm. you are making some efforts to get people to the Science Centre itself. Obviously, there are a lot of experiences that you can have by outreach to schools, but there's, only, there's some that you can only have by, by visiting. And I wondered um, what efforts are being made to ensure that, that schools or sections of schools who are coming to visit, mm -hmm. that there's some coordination, because you'll appreciate that a school that's coming from Uist or Shetland <laughs> um, to come to visit Glasgow or Edinburgh can't do that every time there's something on in Glasgow and Edinburgh. There has to be some level of coordination so mm -hmm. they can do them all in three or four days. Sure. Other fr otherwise, frankly, it's, it's, it's not an option. So mm -hmm. is that level of coordination going on with other cultural organisations and educational organisations to make sure that those kind of trips are possible? That's a really good question. I can kick off and, and say, from my understanding, that's not something that we are part of. I think it's a really interesting point and something that which would be great to look at. Um, we don't look further afield in terms of when, uh, honestly, when we are engaging with um, the like, for example, um, schools in Orkney, only one has ever come to visit us. On, that's, on tour is really our priority for those areas. So we haven't really looked at when they do come down to visit us, what else they're doing. But I'm not sure if any of my colleagues are able to advise. Yeah, I could certainly comment on that because I've experienced the body works uh, twice in, in two different settings and it really is hands on. It's like visiting the Science Centre. So these are invaluable initiatives for supplementing the, uh, uh, the STEM experiences that we're trying to develop in early years in primary. But I want to just go back to you and ask to clarify, have you just asked us what the challenges are in delivering uh, quality uh, uh, STEM in early years in primary? Was that part of your well, question? I was just going to come on to schools and, and early years, but I was, uh, the, the, the question had been raised, or the issue had been raised there about the science centres, but uh, I'm happy to move on to schools in the early years since it, since it seems to prompt me in that direction. But I mean, in terms of, of that, uh, I was wondering on, on that subject, um, we've already talked about parental inequalities, if you like, or differences of opportunities that have existed for parents. And the factor that that is, or that, that still represents in, in inequalities amongst children. So is there any work that's being done either in early years or in primary school uh, to work directly with parents so that parents are included in this process? One of the actions in the strategy is to improve the level of resources available to parents um, through Parent Zone, and, and you can say a bit about that. Equally, within um, the work to support the expansion of early learning and childcare, and I suppose to reiterate Elizabeth's point, that very act of expanding that represents a great opportunity and support for practitioners around that, then there is support that is going into practitioners there around um, things like um, gender neutral play and so on and so forth, which you then hope through interactions with parents spreads back to, to the home environment as well. So there is a whole online module, I think developed by the University of West of Scotland to support early learning practitioners, particularly around their STEM practice, particularly around tackling um, gender stereotypes and through the engagement that early learning practitioners will have with, with parents, and you'd hope that um, there'd be a spread there. But I guess to answer your specific action, it would be the, the additional resources that are going on to parent zone around this point would be, would be the main action there. Um, parents are crucial, you know, and I think the, um, the STEM strategy was very influenced by the Aspires research, which showed the importance of building science and STEM capital within families and communities around Scotland. <clears throat> so it's something we take really seriously. Uh, engaging parents, again, has been part of the work we've been doing through the RAISE programme. I think one of the strengths of the STEM strategy is a big focus on community learning and development. And actually, we've got a real strength in Education Scotland. We're working very closely with our community, community learning and development specialists. 
just over the last few months, for instance, we've been doing a series of uh, events and sessions around Scotland, bringing together community learning and development uh, specialists with early learning uh, specialists and primary and secondary staff, looking at the connections and how we can take STEM into the wider community and families. Uh, our race team, for instance, have been running a lot of different parental engagement events. We just had Angus uh, STEM Festival just last week, I think, over 400 attended. Uh, we had the Leith Family Fun Day, uh, over 700, I think, attended over three days. Uh, we had a family stargazing event in Fife as well. So uh, engaging with parents and finding new ways to engage with parents is really important. Even at a very simple level, within early learning and childcare establishments, one of the things that we've been doing with our race officers is sending STEM bags home, interactive sort of STEM challenges that young people can take home and do with their families at home. We had Scottish Learning Festival last year. One of our keynote speakers was Louise Archer, Professor Louise Archer, who was responsible for the Spires research. We wanted to put it right up front there as part of our big uh, STEM live event at Scottish Learning Festival about the importance of engaging families. So it's just a huge part of what we do. In terms of Parent Zone, uh, we've already got uh, I'm a Mathematician resource <coughs> up there for parents to use and download uh, those activities for use in the home. We've got I'm a Scientist. We've also just finalising uh, a new resource, I'm an engineer, and they're all available in Gaelic as well. So. Very good. Well, finally, in that case, uh, the other thing I was going to ask about was about how you measure the performance that there is on all these fronts. Um, there's performance indicators, and I think we've more or less heard about them there, about the performance indicators in, in the science centres, but um, should there be performance indicators or other performance indicators more widely um, to measure how we're making progress in the area of equity uh, when it comes to access to STEM? So you're right, the, the key indicators in the, the KPIs we produce related to some of the science centre activity. There is also an equity indicator in relation to performance in um, national qualifications around SQF level six, which mirrors um, the, the wider attainment indicator in the national improvement framework. Um, clearly, we published a set of key performance indicators, um, I think December 2017, and the annual report um, published earlier this year provide a report against those. We're going through a process of just reviewing those, not with a view to you know, perhaps introducing a whole set of new ones, but seeing whether there are better ways of producing milestones on the way to those. So a number of those will have um, indicators about developments by 2022, for example, the, the end of the strategy. But what we're um, looking at with colleagues is whether we can produce some additional milestones within that. And if, as part of that work, there are suggestions about you know other um, measurements that should come in there, we'd be very happy to consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bentale. Thank you, I, convener. I'm, I'm particularly interested um, in the challenges facing uh, rural areas uh, from, from a constituency point of view. Um, and you know, I, I think that some of the challenges are, are pretty obvious. Um, and I think particularly um, in one and two teacher schools, just in sheer percentage terms, you're less likely to have someone who's interested in science proactively within the staff base uh, than you would in a larger primary school you know, there are fewer STEM businesses in the vicinity, um, fewer academic institutions operating, science centres are further away. Uh, these schools have smaller budgets, in some cases no access to PEF money. Um, and I was interested, uh, Susan Boyd, when you talked about science visits and other things sort of supplementing, uh, you know, because I, I have a sort of concern that sometimes we focus too much you know, on sort of one-off visits and sort of people think, you know, that they're, that they're, they're, they're sort of covering off STEM, you know, because they do manage a trip out once a year or, or someone comes to, to visit the school. Um, what, what, what do we need to do to, to, you know, to, to, to sort of reverse that imbalance? Well, first of all, I would say that um, in rural areas, you know, we are developing our own ways of, of delivering STEM and, and that, is um, being supported by a lot of people who are passionate about science and, and technology and, and, and the other aspects. Uh, and yeah, these one-off visits are great, uh, but they're only part of what we're doing. Um, where I am at the moment uh, in Aberfeldy, we have got some great professional partnerships with Marine Scotland. And uh, over the last few years, we've been working with Academy 9 Jacobs, who are de uh, uh, developing the A9 dueling project. And what we're doing there is actually 
actually fabulous. You know, they're working, they're not working in the early years, but they're working in uh, middle to upper primary. Uh, but Marie and Scotland are available to everybody within the school. And these are, are, are real scientists and, uh, and engineers that are coming in. And they're great role models. And, you know, you know the gender issue is very well supported, uh, particularly by our Academy 9 uh, uh, scientists and engineers that have been coming in. So I think that we're working on three fronts here. I think Emma's work is fabulous and that has a, a part to play. Uh, but the second front is the actual practitioners. And when I was in Aberdeenshire, I, I was the teacher in the school that I was in. But I did have access to the schools within the cluster. So I was able to, to, to meet regularly and through our tapestry learning initiatives and projects, we were able to team teach and, and visit other schools. And uh, so there was quite a rich and diverse uh, range of opportunities. But I, th I see the biggest challenge as being having those STEM practitioners able to support in the early years. I, I come back to that. And, and additional needs, which we've not mentioned. Workload and additional needs, they are the biggest issues on my challenges to deliver STEM. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, I think what you said, um, is really crucial in the fact that STEM shouldn't be and can't be one teacher's passion. It has to be everybody's. It has to be every teacher that can deliver this to a really high quality all the time, not on one-off science visits, which again, I think are great as provocations or part of it. But as you say, some, some people in our profession do go, right, I've been to Dynamic Earth. Dick, I did that bit of the curriculum. And it cannot be that. In rural communities, the teacher schools, you know, we have issues, but you say that there's no sort of technology around whatever. We just need to look in more interesting ways. In a rural school, you have the rural countryside, which is an amazing way to experience all sorts of STEM activities. We have farming communities. We have all sorts of different kind of industries, but it's just about looking a bit more creatively at how to get them involved, I would have said, in, in rural schools. And again, back to the kind of cluster approach, pulling on people, neighbours, you know, kind of getting together. But I think what, what you said sort of highlights to me exactly one of the problems. It can't just be one person's passion and that, and they're in charge of the whole learning in that school. It can't be, so we need to get to the bottom of that. Um, I guess from that, going back to Dr Allen's question, would you support having more kind of concrete indicators to make sure you know, that, we, that, that we are achieving that kind of model? Um, and, and, and do you think we need more kind of data and, 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 and sort of review to, to make sure that's happening consistently across the country? I think we have to be careful by what we mean of concrete indicators and data, because the minute we start putting in very structured kind of next steps or, or data collection, it can backfire, as we've seen it happen in some instances with some of our other curriculum areas, and as, as teacher's opinion. But I think we definitely need more information i suppose at the minute about what the reality is going on in schools but you probably have more <laughs> well i think that it's a hugely complex issue and i think that you know as is mentioned in in some of the papers in here there are a number of initiatives and as i've said and and, and keep saying i am passionate about stem but i see that there are a lot of other areas of need and i think that um stem will be supported if we address some of the challenges we're facing in early years and primary years education as a whole and yes we would like to have these indicators so that we could gauge how we're doing but I think that um, you know early year staff um, uh, there's a high turnover in early year staff and so we may train people uh, and give them resources but we need to retain them and we need to have those professionals that are able to deliver uh, the broad general education that we're all hoping for and that includes STEM and that means that, that people that are vital to the well-being of pupils and their development of their learning are not just teachers but they are the support staff that we are desperate to retain because you know, STEM is highly resource, uh, um, um, you know, we need resources for STEM in that, you know, to deliver science in any way in the primary or in the early years, we need to create the resources, we need to set them up, uh, and then we need to teach them. 
And, you know, we don't have enough bodies on the ground to do that effectively. We may be doing it, but we're not doing it effectively. And a lot of it is being done on the goodwill of early years practitioners and teachers. So let's have a framework that's really going to deliver support for STEM and support for teachers. Yes, we're really um, sort of aware of the, the needs of rural areas, and it's something that we've been working on for, for a number of years. For instance, when we set up the Raising Aspirations in Science Education programme, and we were looking to identify, uh, sorry, to engage with authorities around Scotland, we deliberately chose authorities that had challenges around rurality, including Highlands, Dumfries and Galloway, and Murray. What we also did is we recognised the big challenges in terms of geography, so we made sure that uh, those... Um, uh, those authorities, particularly Highlands and Dumfries and Galloway and also Fife, had additional resource uh, to employ um, you know, two raise officers, for instance, in Highland. Uh, Dumfries and Galloway had two or three raise officers. So it's something that we're really conscious of. Uh, part of the partnership working we're doing with the raise officers is we realise that there's a, a real challenge sometimes connecting schools in rural areas to local employers. So we've been working in partnership with the STEM Ambassador Hubs uh, within the west of uh, Scotland. And just in the last 12 months, we've increased the number of STEM Ambassadors active within Dumfries and Galloway from 36 to 115. Uh, in Highlands, we talked earlier on about the Science Centre model and accessing a Science Centre. So in Highlands, uh, the Highlands Skills Academy are just in the process of launching and opening new Newton rooms, five Newton rooms across the Highlands. Uh, the one in Thurso has been opened and one in Lochaber has been opened to give these rural areas that, that science-centred experience. University of Highlands and Islands have got a very active STEM hub that's doing a lot of outreach across the area, as does Aberdeen Science Centre. Um, through our grants programme, for instance, we provided funding to Highland Council. Uh, they've got big challenges in terms of rurality and remoteness. So they're now delivering professional learning to early learning and childcare and primary staff virtually as well, so that support we've been able to do through our grants programme. We're hearing really strongly from our practitioner surveys, which has given us really important data in this, this area. The practitioners absolutely want more support online, and that goes for practitioners in rural areas as, opposed to, and as well as others. So again, through the grants programme, we're really trying to enhance that offer of online professional learning support. And I think to pick up on the point about, you know, drawing on what's available locally, uh, you know, in the grants programme this year, we've introduced a new funding stream called the Leadership and Collegiate Professional Learning Fund. And what practitioners have told us really strongly is that that opportunity to work with practitioners within the schools, within your clusters, is really valuable and has a high impact on a professional learning. So, for instance, for early learning and childcare, 70% said that working collegially within your cluster has a high or very high impact. Uh, within early learning and childcare, they said 81% working collegiately within your setting has a high or very high impact. So this new funding stream is to give teachers the space and time locally to draw on their collective expertise, the resources, to learn together, to collaborate, to co-develop new approaches. So the rurality aspect is really important. We'll continue to track that through our surveys. Uh, and also the provider survey. So one of the surveys we provided, or just published last week, was the STEM provider survey. So we're now actually looking at all the providers across Scotland, the science centres, the festivals, universities. We're inviting them to share that information with us so that we can see you know, the, the service the offer that's been provided to different local authorities and plug those gaps where we can. Um, and, and in terms... In term, sorry. That's what, yeah. Sorry, I, I just wanted to, to say that I'm really happy to hear of all these developments and, and they are starting to have an effect, which is great. But I would like to highlight in the papers my, my union's uh, uh, concerns, which was, were brought by members and which I want to be absolutely clear that you can have a passion for science, you can have all the training in the world, but you need the staff to deliver that. And if you have a class of uh, um, 25 children with with a, a large percentage of additional needs and you do not have any support in that classroom. You may be creative and bring in STEM professional volunteers or parents and that is the way you're delivering it, but you need to actually have the staffing to consistently deliver STEM. Um, I, I, I was perfect. just going to follow up on the collegiate fund and just ask how much, how much money is made available um, and whether or not it's, it's available for classroom cover. Um, the Collegiate Fund, um, the Enhancing Professional Learning Fund um, has two funding streams. 
One is for regional and national partners. So the regional and national partners include um, organisations like science centres and festivals, universities, colleges, <coughs> uh, professional associations, third sector organisations, learning societies, for instance. Uh, and the Cle Leadership and Collegiate Professional Learning Fund yeah. is more of the sort of practitioner-led professional yeah, that's, learning. That's, that's, so that's, the totality that's one of I'm that. interested in the, sec the second stream and yeah. how, just how much money... So there's £1.3 million pounds available this financial year for the whole of the Enhancing Professional Learning uh, Grants Programme, which is the two funding streams. There's, and there's not a breakdown? There's not a breakdown two. just now. We're going to just look at the demand you know, from the system, the bids that come in, and look at where we can make that money work the hardest. So. And, and will it be available for classroom cover to allow teachers out of the classroom to... The part of that may be classroom cover. So, for instance, one of the things that we know within different clusters, um, you know, you can have practitioners like Susan with a background, a passion for science and STEM. They, they've got a lot of, um, you know, to share in terms of building confidence of other practitioners within primary schools, for instance, within a cluster or working with early learning and childcare. So where, for instance, uh, we can make use of like Susan's resource or capacity or expertise, that money can be used to release them from the classroom to provide that face-to-face -face support in other settings. Mr. Um, I, I, I think quite a lot of the lines of questioning come down to the, the same thing, really, approach from different sides, which is about how do we mainstream the delivery of, of STEM education in early years? Um, uh, and a couple of questions ago, Susan, you were asked about that, and you said it's complicated. But in some ways, it's not complicated, is it? It's really simple. I mean, if, if we went to any primary school or early years setting and ask them what do you do in terms of literacy, none of them would say we went to the library last year. But if we go and say what do you do in terms of STEM education, they might say well we did a visit to the science centre. That's the problem really, isn't it? The problem is that the system does not recognise this as being core in the same way as it recognises rightly things like literacy and numeracy, speech and language development, other things which are considered core. So what, what is the thing which will change that mindset so that all schools, all early years settings understand that this isn't an option, this is, this is something we really need them to be delivering? Um, I think what would begin to help is, uh, is raising its profile within a lot of the policy and documentation that we have. So a lot of the things like the new national standard, for example, that's coming out for expansion in early learning and childcare, um, the references sort of to the curriculum, the references to the curriculum in the other documents we have, like Higgy Elk, how good is our early learning and childcare? There's a lot of literacy and numeracy and health and wellbeing. There is words like curiosity and imagination and creativity, but it's helping our practitioners link those words. <laughs> You're yeah, there then, that's Education Scotland and the government's fault. You are actually not asking the system to deliver on this in the same way as you do in literacy and numeracy. So they don't. Why would they? I suppose two points. I think your initial point, Mr Gray, was that it's not part of the core curriculum. I, I think it is part of the core curriculum. Three out well, of the eight... It doesn't sound like it is. Elizabeth Kelly's just said... But, but in, ter really? in terms of this, the systems, the policy framework, three out of the eight curricular areas are STEM-related. Um, so it covers mathematics, um, sciences, and technology. So, so it's part of the framework. Um, what I certainly accept is that in the National Improvement Framework and the priorities that the government has set, there is a focus on literacy and numeracy, on raising attainment, on health and well-being, and on um, wider sort of developing young workforce types. And that's what the position the government set out the National Improvement Framework, but I think I would counter the suggestion it's not part of the core framework. It is. Now, what I certainly accept is the challenge that you posed around the extent to which there is that, that confidence, time dedicated to actually delivering that. And I think the actions in the STEM strategy are designed to, to respond to that. So to deal with um, the expansion of early learning and childcare and trying to get sure that, that, that the STEM is properly in there. I alluded earlier on to the, the package of support that's going in to support the workforce around that. So I, I think it is there, but you know, I, I certainly wouldn't um, dispute what Elizabeth and others say about the, the need to um, support it um, even further. Well, but you kind of are disputing what she said, because she said it's not prioritised in the documents that practitioners in the system believe they're being held to account to. 
And you're saying that it is, it is there. You can't. You can't well, both be well I'm saying it does feature in the support that we're we're putting in place, and certainly in um, what we're trying to do around things like uh, learning and, and outdoor learning as well. Um, but there's an interesting question here about prioritising. Um, there's danger that if everything is a priority, nothing's a priority. Now, clearly, mm -hmm. um, exactly. this, the government so, has put so, it... Sorry, so are you saying STEM isn't a priority? Um, well, STEM is clearly not one of the priorities that are set out in the National Improvement Framework. Okay. That, that is clear. Thanks. That said, well, it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. <clears throat> Um, and there's all sorts of stuff that's happening. The STEM strategy is just one of them, um, as is the fact that it features so heavily in the broad general education. Well, well you say that, but... Mr. Kay, can I just, just check? I think Ms. Kelly still Sorry. had some points yeah. to make on that, if um, you could just let her finish. No, it, really just that, yeah, it's, it's about, I suppose, the priority. And even if these things are coming down to the government, the teachers on the ground, in their head, it's about literacy, numeracy and health and wellbeing. Often the inspections that Education Scotland do have that focus or certainly have done um, in, in recent times. But also with STEM, though, that's the problem. I feel we're very siloed back into these subject disciplines when actually something like STEM enhances literacy or literally enhances it and, and numeracy that they shouldn't be different, especially in sure. early years. It's a very interdisciplinary um, pedagogy that we use. Play is, is the main source of the learning, as it were. And, and in something like a den building exercise, for example, we are, we, a child can experience literacy, numeracy, engineering, technology, science, the whole combined, depending on what that child's interests are and how the practitioner is helping them, they will bring a different element out of that experience. So for me, it's about bringing us back to how I feel the curriculum for excellence was meant to be, which was about working together in real meaningful contexts with an interdisciplinary focus. But for some reason, and I'm not blaming anyone, we seem to have gone very literacy and numeracy, but, but separate. And literacy and numeracy, of course, are, are so important, the foundations of everything, but we've lost sight of the rest a wee bit. Ms. Boyd, you wanted to come in as well, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really just backing up a, a lot of what Elizabeth has said, that in fact STEM is being delivered hugely through interdisciplinary learning. In fact, almost to the point that, uh, you know, we're concerned a little bit, scientists, that maybe the progression in science, knowledge and skills isn't perhaps being attended to uh, 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 as well as we should be. But that might be a bit more for, for middle and upper primary where, where I'm moving into at the moment. But I would say that in the early years and... Uh, uh, right up to middle primary through interdisciplinary learning projects, outdoor learning, forest schools, all these uh, marvellous initiatives that are being developed uh, within early years in primary. We are delivering a lot of STEM. But, but one of the things you said earlier on, Susan, was, and you've used this example a couple of times, was you were in Highland part of a team who went into early year settings and worked with, alongside practitioners there to um, to raise the, the quality of delivery of what you've just described. But then you also said that team was the first thing to go when cuts came. Is that right? Well, I have uh, to say that that, that, that is correct, that right. that team has gone. And, and, and in fact, it's much more along the model, I think, that Elizabeth's working in, where she's supporting many more centres. Uh, and, you know, having worked in early years, I mean, early years practitioners are being asked, they're not teachers, but they're being asked to teach children at a level that, sure. the, the same as a teacher. And then they have all the care standards on top of that. And, you know, they have a lot on their plate. And, uh, you know, it's how we support that. And, you know, I, I, I really, you know, would say that we need to support that with more teachers like Elizabeth who are out there on the ground, you know, working and reinforcing a, a good practice across all disciplines. And, you know, STEM would benefit from that. So, so my question really is, uh, I suppose it's a version of the, the, question, the question which uh, Andrew was dealing with is how much of a priority are we really giving this? And you seem to be saying that perhaps not as high a priority as sometimes we purport. Well, in terms of the resource, I can't answer that question fully because you know my authority isn't in the the, the, the raise program, and I'm hoping they're joining uh, because and obviously there's fun, additional funding which would allow groups like the STEM that, working group. Is that not the point? That if this was core business, it 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 wouldn't be who's in the raise program, who's not in the raise program. That that would be support. I know it is available everywhere, you've made that point, but it's not taken up everywhere because there are other priorities. 
Yeah, so one of the things we've done over the last um, four months is we recruited a new STEM team, a new team of STEM education officers. So we have seven or eight in post just now. They are now uh, embedded within the new regional teams the Education Scotland has set up. So every region across Scotland has a dedicated STEM education officer. Uh, when we're up to full complement, we'll also have a dedicated improving gender balance and equality officer uh, within each of those regional teams. I think we've got some really exciting opportunities within the new regional infrastructure. Uh, our new STEM education officers, our improving gender balance officers, will absolutely be working in harness with the mathematics and numeracy officers, with the literacy officers, uh, with the attainment advisors within those regional teams. And I think we've got a real opportunity to join us up. It's something that we're really excited about. We feel really strongly, and it's a big part of our work through the RACE programme. The STEM is a context that really brings the curriculum to life. And all the learning that takes place within the curriculum areas within sciences, technologies, and mathematics and numeracy is really brought to life through a STEM context. So it shouldn't really be seen as something that is additional, but it's something that just provides a really engaging, motivating, exciting context for learners that enables them to connect their learning within the classroom, with outdoor settings, with the real life. So our new STEM teams are absolutely a part about that system change, about that equity of provision, and about that mainstreaming. Uh, no, I just noticed that it, in the papers you'd mentioned that the, the regional improvement collaboratives. That's, is that a new initiative as well that's, that's going to be rolled out in, involving these officers? Absolutely. So the local authorities are coming together within these new regional improvement collaboratives. Education Scotland is, over the last few months, is uh, refocusing our work uh, to support those regional improvement collaboratives. I think, you know, just even in the last month, I'm really excited by the conversations our, our STEM officer team and our gender balance officer team are having with their counterparts within the regional collaboratives. With local authorities, there's a real energy about it. There is a really big focus on STEM. One of the things we're doing already with the West Partnership, one of the biggest collaboratives, is from the word go, they've identified STEM and also learning for sustainability as a focus area for them. So we're working in partnership with them, Keep Scotland Beautiful, looking at the upstream battle campaign along the River Clyde. It's actually looking at marine plastic pollution, a really exciting context for learner for, for, uh, for uh, schools and for young people. So there's one of the big authorities, or sorry, the big regional collaboratives already saying uh, they want this close partnership working on learning for sustainability in STEM, and that's what we're really happy to support. Susan and Elizabeth have said this, this won't happen everywhere unless in every setting there's enough resources and specifically enough staff to actually make that play through. So what's your response to that? I mean, the good practice can be there and the support can be there, but if the teachers and technicians and support staff aren't in the classrooms, they're saying it won't happen. So I guess the initial starting point for that would be around um, those areas where there are shortages in, in teachers. And I think we acknowledge those. The targets for intake of those into the ITEs has been increased and indeed the numbers are going up. That's supported by the STEM bursary scheme. So there are attempts to, to, to address that, um, but I don't pretend it's anything other. Um, That's secondary that. teachers, though. We're talking about primary and early years here. Um, so I, I don't have the figures to, to hand about the situation with primary school teachers um, across the picture, and I'm happy to sort of provide that um, later on. But I suppose the point I'm trying to make is it's something that um, we are looking at very carefully in terms of the supply in, into the system. Um, the point that Ian makes around the support that Education Scotland are providing um, to the regions, that is a consistent um, picture. So Education Scotland sure. has adopted its new structure that's based on the regional structures. Those regional structures are coterminous with the regional improvement collaborative. So there's been a, a real um, change in the infrastructure to make sure that the support that Education Scotland provide, and Ian's alluded there to the specific STEM expertise, are aligned with the new regional improvement collaboratives to provide that um, consistently. Okay. okay. Mr. Scott, were you wanting a supplementary in this area or a new area? Yeah, I've got uh, some on this area as well. Can I ask some supplementaries on this? Um, yeah, I'm going to bring in Ms. Mackay first because gender was mentioned there and I know there's an interest there. I'd like to follow that up. Yeah, if I could go back, please, to the um, equity of access regarding gender. Um, Andrew, Bruce, you, you mentioned, uh, I was interested in parental involvement because we know a lot of gender stereotyping st you know, starts in, in the home. The modules you talked about, was that relating to early years or is that secondary education? That was, the 
Joe, I mentioned was the support that's going into the, um, the workforce around early years. It's a University of West of Scotland resource. Um, Ian, you'll keep me right on this. Um, it covers a number of things. One of it is around, well, some of it is, is promoting STEM in those early learning settings, but includes tackling um, gender stereotypes as well. Alongside that, Care and Spectrate have been working with Zero Tolerance to produce a series of resources around promoting gender neutral play. Um, in addition to that, which Ian will, will be able to speak at length about, there is the expansion of the, um, the pilot that was around improving gender balance, which um, took place in schools. But the, the focus of that will go beyond schools into other settings as well. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe explain a bit about how the parents are involved? How, what, what form does it take, the module, and, and what's the uptake on it from parents? So forgive me, the module is for early learning practitioners, right. um, but part of, um, I suppose, the theory here is that practitioners will be having engagements with right. with parents and the, the chance to spread that yeah. um, that, that learning approach so that way. So has that started? Uh, I'm not sure. It's literally just um, in development just now and is due to be uh, finalised at the end of this year. Okay, and how will you monitor what the uptake is and how, you know, how that's succeeding? Or do, you, do you have a plan to monitor, you know, how, how that's going? That will all be um, work that's underway over the coming months, you know, as this, um, this new online module takes shape, and this is to support the expansion of early years. Uh -huh. So there is going to be a focus on STEM within that, uh, and also gender balance, and actually I'll be chairing that piece of work in partnership with our Scottish Government colleagues. So that gives us a real chance to make sure it's fully connected to our ambitions within the STEM strategy, uh, which I think is really important. So in terms of monitoring the stats, the usage, the uptake, the engagement, that will all be embedded, I'm sure, within the resources it develops. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, you, you mentioned uh, in your opening speech that there was a massive opportunity in early years for STEM, and, and that's good, and, and I agree with that. But um, the 2018 report, Tapping All Our Talents, which was a, a report on, on women in STEM subjects, etc. Um, part of it says, where progress has been made, this is frequently due to the personal interest in the issue of one or several individuals within a school and their drive to create change. Um, how much do you think that is a factor? Because I think that might be quite impo very important. You know, if, if, if um, me teachers might know about it and, and they might think, ah, you know, I'm not that, you know, so they, they don't actually focus on it. Is there any way of addressing that? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's yeah hugely influential, and that's um, what we've kind of said, and that's what I sort of said in my paper across the early years um, landscape, if you like. It's very varied depending on what everybody's interested in. So in one setting, yes, you might get an early years practitioner who is either a woman or a man, probably a woman because that's the situation we're in. Although the early years community are trying massively to change um, the, the, the gender, as you were, in our workforce. And if that person is really interested in STEM, then they might create that really STEM environment. And that's what we were talking about. We can't have that. It needs to be everywhere all the time. So not just um, one person, as it were. Um, the gender imbalance in... I think our practitioners are working really hard, actually, to conquer some of their unconscious bias when it comes to gender. Um, and I think we're mainly succeeding, but I certainly don't think we're in a position yet where we can start influencing parents because they're not... A lot of practitioners probably aren't strong enough yet on, on that understanding themselves. They're going to, to help with that. But what is lovely about most early learning childcare settings is really children play anywhere all the time. So we will have girls in block corners, boys in the house corner, and that is... That is lovely, and that has been developing over the years. We've got rid of a lot of princess outfits and all that kind of stuff, and it's becoming a lot more. I think I went off there. Sorry. Did well, that answer so your question at <laughs> the beginning? <laughs> um, so, 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 is this part of the new um, training for the new early years practitioners that were, you know, the drive that's the recruitment drive that's on? Is this part of the gender of the, imbalance? Yes. Uh -huh. it, again, it would totally depend, in my experience, on who's delivering that training. So, for example, in Midlothian, we have MAs, modern apprentices, coming into our gov um, to our local authority, and we're delivering that training ourselves through um, the team that I work with. And yes, I have no doubt that they will be addressing that at that point. But in other authorities, they're going through, like Edinburgh College, maybe they've got SVQ3. Some of them are doing. They're beginning to do like nat fives in high school, and it's all very mixed as to what is inputted into those courses. So I couldn't guarantee it's yeah. being addressed. No. And in your work, are you finding that parents are receptive at the early years level to, to you know, to the, the their daughters being involved in in, in STEM stuff, or is there any resistance it, to that? It varies. Um, mm. It varies massively from from community to community and, and parent to parent. Um, I mean, even and, and our practitioners do 
on the whole, do a very good job of, of helping parents understand that, you know, we encourage every child to do everything in our setting. But, you know, likewise before, when we had the princess outfits, for example, you might get a little boy dressing up in a princess outfit and there'd be a picture of that in his learning profile. And there would have to be a conversation sometimes with parents about how that was absolutely acceptable and fine. And that was nothing for them, you know, to be worried about. But that is a, a kind of ongoing thing, but it does need the parent dialogue sometimes. I think the kind of STEM capital in the families is, is really interesting to look at. And, but again, it's quite a complex area, though, because some, some parents in some of our areas, are more potentially the deprived areas, just the words are, are kind of frightening, you know? Yeah. They're a bit like, whoa, yeah. what's, you know, what's that all about? I'm not, whoa, that's not for us. And so that that's kind of the importance of communicating it well. Yeah. And, and again, and for me, back to the some of the community projects, like community gardening, and you're gardening alongside somebody, and then you're talking about, actually, this is, this is science, and we're learning about this, and we're learning about that. And, mm -hmm. Uh, and doing it in that more natural, relaxed way rather than this is STEM and you're going to need to teach that to your child at home, which is just... Yeah. <laughs> so. and just, just my final question is just how, how do you sort of, um, or can you ensure that that's carried on through the, pri through the primary years when things become you know, more intense and they're working to the curriculum, etc.? How, how's, how does the, the, this, you know, the, 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 the basis in early years transfer to primary? Well, you've um, <clears throat> hit upon a huge can of worms, generally, in how early years is being transferred up into the primary within Scotland at the moment. Um, and personally, I, I can't. Um, we do try and influence the transition into, into P1. A lot of authorities are trying to make the early level work now as an early level. So nursery into primary one and that flow and the communication with primary one teachers and all that kind of thing. But it does still, in my um, experience, and Susan would probably know more, look, it can look like a very different animal in a primary school mm -hmm. than it does in an early learning and childcare mm -hmm. centre. Yeah. Yeah. Bring in Mr Menzies and I'll come to you, Ms Boyd. Thanks. Um, yes, I mean, I think the point in terms of improving gender balance and equalities, this is complex. You know, we looked at our data over the last 35 years in terms of the uptake of um, uh, hires, STEM hires within secondary schools, and over the last 35 years, we have made very little impact, both in terms of the participation of girls in subjects like physics, uh, and also computing, technology-based subjects, but also as well about boys in biology. So we've got an under-representation of boys in biology. So there is a lot of work to do. This is complex work. It does involve a whole system change. This is about a mind shift for the whole of society. Uh, this is why we've got a new gender balance team in place within Education Scotland that will be embedded within these new regional teams. Uh, this isn't new work for us. This is work that's been underway for, for three years. So we've done a lot of learning over the last three years within our pilot programme. We've drawn heavily on research. We've provided over 2,500 uh, hours of professional learning to teachers in the system, over 5,000 hours of engagement with pupils, uh, over 3,000 hours of engaging with stakeholders in the system, you know, different organisations and so on. So we're drawing on all of that experience over the last three years to take this work forward. Our big target, which is challenging and ambitious, is to reach every school cluster in Scotland in the next four years. And for us, one of the key aspects of this has to be a very strong cluster-based approach. This isn't something that a primary school can do on their own. It's not something that an early learning establishment can do on their own. It's something that we all have to do as a whole community and a whole society. Uh, and actually, one of the things we've been doing, you know, as part of the early years expansion, we've talked about this new module that's been developed and picking up some of the earlier points about, you know, the policy and how it reflects STEM and gender balance. But the new induction resource for the early years expansion does talk about gender and about encouraging gender and neutral practice. Uh, I think we're going to have a refresh of building the ambition document for early learning childcare. So that gives us an opportunity to put STEM in there and issues like gender balance as well. So... You know, there's a big piece of work under we're really excited by it. I think one of the things we're really excited by is just the sheer demand for, for time and engagement from our new team. And we're looking forward to seeing how that work and those discussions continue. Um, well, there's kind of two issues I think we've touched on, on here and uh, um, uh, the early years into primary and I would say that there's a lot of work being done to make it a more uh, um, a seamless transition and the value of play, uh, it, you know, right through primary is a mo lot more acceptable in our learning and teaching environments within a primary school now. Uh, the second thing is the gender equality and I, I would like to say that, you know, certainly within the setting that I'm in at the moment, 
moment, we've got a perfect scenario where we're running from er er early <coughs> years right up to the end of secondary. And we're you know, very much promoting uh, uh, young women and, and girls to, to move into uh, roles of responsibility within STEM. In fact, our primary STEM prefix this year, there are more girls than, than boys. Can I In just stop you there? How are you promoting it? What, what, you know, how does that well, happen? Well, because... We are all aware of the importance of STEM, even if some primary practitioners and, and uh, early uh, years practitioners maybe aren't confident, but they are aware of the importance of it. So in our planning for play and learning, we are making sure that we are giving opportunities to, 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 to both male and female, and that, that we are positively promoting those experiences uh, uh, with girls. And I know my colleagues in the secondary are doing a marvellous job um, you know, we've got great role models because, in, in fact, three out of the four uh, um, principal teachers in our secondary are women, and they're down in the nursery and they are in the primary. So we're very much showing good role models and working in our workshops with parents uh, to share the STEM learning that we're doing in a, in a way that, that isn't, is demystifying these subjects and not making them a, 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 a worry for parents or for children. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to uh, pick up on something that Elizabeth Kelly said in her answer to Rona Mackay, and it was, it needs to be everywhere all the time. And I wonder if you would accept that there might be a challenge here for our primary teachers who are trained to be generalists. Um, I guess I'm thinking about one of my friends who has a politics degree and then went on to do a postgrad in primary teaching. She might not naturally have, you know, an inclination to, to deliver STEM in the way that others might who have a specialism in it. She will have an opportunity and an obligation to deliver it through the BGE, as we've heard from Andrew Bruce, but her interest might lie elsewhere. So is there a challenge there, uh, potentially in terms of disempowering the profession if it's you know, being instructed? And, and would you also perhaps have any suggestions as to what the answer might be there? I mean, we heard, I think, in a previous evidence session from the RSC about um, the level of qualifications for primary teachers going in. Um, and I think the RSC were advancing um, the idea that you should have a higher qualification in maths, for example, which is not, I think, at the moment, um, currently required, I think it's uh, in five level. So what's your kind of answer to that challenge about primary teachers being generalists? Well, it's, it's a huge question, isn't it? Because yeah. as a primary school teacher, you are expected to be uh, brilliant at teaching music these days as well, and mm -hmm. PE and art and everything. And you're right, we all come from very different backgrounds. My own first degree was in history. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I love doing a social science thing on Vikings, that's my thing, but I also <laughs> love STEM. I think Primary school teachers have to accept that when we come into the profession. That is the profession that we're in. If we want to be specialist subject teachers, we go on to secondary school. Yeah. So there has to be an awareness that you have to be passionate <laughs> about learning and teaching, and therefore we're passionate about all our subjects. There will be a bit more expertise in one than the other because of your, your previous life, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't, that shouldn't control the curriculum you present in your classroom. Mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe that. I shouldn't just teach history all the time because that's what I was previously interested in. And likewise, when I say STEM should be all the time every day, I mean it shouldn't be a week of science. Yeah. We do a week of science, there we go. Or we go to Dynamic Earth and we do. It should be, because if you look at a lot of the primary school, although I'm not currently in primary school, but in my experience, if you look at a primary school timetable, if you went into like a primary three classroom, there's a lot of, there's a big literacy block and there's a numeracy and then there might be a wee bit of topic. And there's a big literacy, not in all schools, but this is the kind of, so that's what I mean about interdisciplinary learning. I feel we need to start looking at literacy through being outside, through a gardening project, through an engineering project. We're designing, you know, a new Mars lunar landing, but we're also learning literacy whilst we're doing that so that we don't get into these blocks of, I need to spend an hour teaching literacy mm -hmm. before I can look at STEM. Yeah. So I think... Um, yes, I think it's appropriate at this time just to, um, to highlight a little bit about our, our approach to teacher training. So I think in, in some ways it can really answer the, this individual that you're mentioning who maybe comes, doesn't come from a STEM background and how we can empower them to see STEM as relevant and to make sure that they feel that they can facilitate STEM learning. Mm -hmm. 
And I think our Inspire and Challenge approach really does that. And I come at this from an angle of somebody who went through our school system and went directly in, uh, into a PhD in an excellent research institute and was faced with having to have the confidence to be a, an active research scientist. Um, and that's not about knowledge. Um, it's about skills. It's about having the confidence in yourself to investigate, to use observational skills, to categorise, to analyse. These are things that all of us will have done in the sort of few hours before we even came into this room today. And I think our Inspire and Challenge approach tries to highlight to um, anybody, whether that's a primary, secondary or early years teacher or practitioner, um, that they don't need to have the answers. Mm -hmm. They don't need to have a, a, an in-depth knowledge on any of these topics. I have a PhD and I, there's lots about even my PhD subject that I'll, I'll never know. So it's about really um, encouraging them to... Um, invest in the pupils and developing the pupils' skills. And that, um, I, I totally agree with Elizabeth and that that can happen inside of any different type of lesson. You can categorise in any lesson, you can observe in any lesson, you can uh, try and use those skills. And it's not about, for me, that we need to recognise the importance of building those skills in a lesson to be a scientist, to use those in every day, whether, whether they end up working in the STEM um, industry or not at all. These are very important skills. And I think our approach uh, helps to build and give, uh, give give um, teachers and practitioners confidence. Um, so we have trained 240 teachers in Inspire and Challenge, uh, primarily in Western Bartonshire uh, region over the last uh, three years. And prior to uh, funding, teachers will rate their confidence in teaching STEM 2.6 out of 5. And after training, they will rate, they rate it 3.4 out of 5. And having been on the ground and done that training myself and spoken to the teachers and having to see them through um, beginning this, uh, this journey to increasing their confidence in STEM, I think it's really them recognising that they don't have to know the answers and that, and that they need to support their pupils to have free investigation, time for free investigation and recognising that is, I have, have seen it being hugely beneficial to the learning experience uh, of their pupils. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to evidence we heard from Lorna Hay, who's a primary teacher in my constituency in Paducah East Primary School, um, because she told the committee previously about evidence which suggests that if children are not exposed to STEM-based subjects by age 10, so I think primary six, um, then they just won't choose them later um, on in their school career. So do you think then by, and this is really for the practitioners, by the time you get to, to secondary school, any interventions around about challenging that gender divide are too late? Oh, right, okay, that's a really difficult question to really answer. I think that, you know, I would have to say that my experience of early years is that there's a lot of rich STEM things going on. And I think it's mentioned in the papers without early years practitioners or anybody, parents, really knowing that it is STEM. Yeah. Because, you know, everything is mass, we know that. And, uh, you know, so I think a lot of that is happening. The worry is that when we get into primary, um, you know, do you know? Do we have the the know-how in these STEM subjects? And you know, we, we talked about interdisciplinary learning. We've also got to look. I mentioned when we were putting together the Highland Science Program, our concern was that that science wasn't being taught in a cohesive and progressive way within primary schools now, because it was all being taught through interdisciplinary learning. And so this gives us a problem when we get to that to 10 plus bracket, because we're wanting children to be interested in chemistry and physics and biology. We want them to, to be interested in those subjects. And so they've got to be taught them. They've got to have the knowledge and they've got to be being taught those skills. And I'm not sure that that's happening consistently. Can I ask you on that point then? Would you advise that they should be taught discreetly? Because I guess the challenge for science-based subjects is that when pupils enter S1, science is usually delivered until the end of S3 uh, as a general subject. And it might not be obvious to people that they are studying physics, chemistry or biology. So is that a challenge in primary, you would say, as well, then? Yeah, I think that it's one of those things that it's actually, it is so complex because actually it's great for children not to be aware that they're doing chemistry. Uh -huh. When they're out doing the Coca-Cola and Mentos challenge, little do they know they're actually exploring a science concept that people are still arguing about. Mm -hmm. You know, a, you know, a high level scientists are still arguing about. But yeah, the, I think that, that we need to be clear that in, you know, in, once we start getting into primary, we, we need to have interdisciplinary learning that's rich and diverse and important, but we need to be teaching discrete science skills and lessons as well, and we need the skills and the training to do that. 
Okay, and, and just finally, convener, um, if I can ask a question to Ian Menzies, and I should say, just to make the committee aware, I did used to work with Ian in a previous life at Education Scotland. Um, I'm really interested, Ian, in the role of Education Scotland in supporting this. Um, you're a senior education officer, so what does your role look like? And I've, I've not worked in Education Scotland for five years now, so can you, you maybe just back? explain? Well, <laughs> can you maybe just explain how SEOs work with HMI um, to ensure consistent delivery in terms of equalities? Um, we've heard, I think, from Professor, Professor Ian Wall previously that um, the last five inspection reports of primary schools in a year, uh, equalities was dealt with in one case in two sentences, and in the others in one sentence. I mean, I appreciate you're not a member of HMI, but how do SEOs work with HMI? And can you maybe tell us a wee bit about if you have development officers round about you centrally? I know I appreciate you've spoken today about the RICs, but within Education Scotland centrally, are you still supported by a team? How, what does that support look like? Um, I think this is one of the, you know, the fabulous strengths of Education Scotland. Do you know, when I came into post um, a number of years ago, one of the first things that was presented to me was the Curriculum Impact Report for Sciences, the 3 to 18 yeah. Curriculum Impact Report. And that was a piece of work that had been done by the inspectors looking at the strengths of the system in terms of sciences and aspects for development. And that became my work plan, do you know, and it was really nice over the, the years to have that you know, that day-to-day -day contact with our, our HMI colleagues. You know, occasionally they'll say, you know, there's really fabulous practice in that school. It'd be really wonderful for you to go in and, and find out how we can share that more effectively. So, for instance, we did that to Moff Academy uh, a couple yeah. of years ago with a really strong cluster approach. And we were able to go in following inspection and organise an open day and invite people from around Scotland to come and, and see the practice that was taking place there. Uh, similarly, our inspectors would give us intelligence to say, um, do you know, here's an area of support that we need in terms of STEM, and we can mobilise our, our resources within our curriculum teams to, to provide that support. I think in terms of the in inspections, you know, some of the, the feedback we're seeing is we're seeing positive progress being made in terms of STEM. We're seeing examples of really highly effective practice, but it's still variable. Uh, where practice is strongest, the settings are, are making really good use of partnerships you know, with local employers and so on, really developing the set of the skills of their learners. Uh, we are seeing you know, examples of uh, practice where practitioners are challenging traditional stereotypes. So all of this intelligence from the inspection is really useful for our work. In terms of the resources we have, um, for the last four months I've been managing the new team of um, STEM officers within Education Scotland. I also have oversight of the Improving Gender Balance and Equalities team. The RAISE programme, for instance, is led by uh, Gail Duffus, who's a National Education Officer for the RAISE programme. Uh, she's actually employed by the Wood Foundation, but in based within Education Scotland. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, I have oversight of all of um, that work, uh, trying to help to shape, to coordinate it. We're moving into a new space within Education Scotland because the staff and all of us, including myself, are now uh, you know, embedded within these new regional teams, but that gives us sort of wonderful new opportunities. And so the new staff will be embedded within the regions. We'll be working with literacy officers, as I said, numerous officers, attainment advisors. But I'll still have an oversight and a role. Uh, we'll have regular opportunities to come together to look at the STEM strategy, to look at feedback from practitioners, to look at the data from our STEM survey and really try and you know, develop that vision and those actions to really sort of deliver on the impact we want to see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Scott? You. Um, I wonder if I could ask our teachers whether rising class sizes in primary schools is helping or hindering the teaching of STEM subjects. Right, okay. Um, well, I'm in the fortunate position that I'm in a rural school. So although I've taught in Inverness in a city school where I had the maximum uh, amount of children, that was quite a well-supported and resourced school. So, uh, and at that time, which is a few years back, that wasn't an issue. Where I am at the moment, you know, our class sizes are, are, are good. So yeah. I can't really comment on that being an issue. All I can comment on is that um, this is the first year in 15 years that I have had no classroom support. And if you have 80% of your children with additional support needs, that is a very tough ask. It's uh, tough to deliver the core curriculum, but it's tough to develop STEM. Mm. Indeed. Um, I, yeah, I can. Um, well, in early learning and childcare, we have um, certain ratios that we have to adhere to. So even if you have 80 children in a building, um, <laughs> which we try not to do, um, you have a ratio, you know, a kind of one to 10, one mm. to eight ratio. So I suppose in that way, it doesn't, it doesn't affect. Um, in my personal experience, the more qualified, great staff you have to number of children, the better the learning experience. But the broad 
uh, the government's own figures obviously show that class sizes in primary schools in most parts of Scotland are rising yeah. significantly. So those pressures are clear. I but that, the clear. general pressures, that they affect all aspects of teaching. Yeah, and I think class size, I mean, where, I don't really know, maybe you don't know where the figure came from in the first place, but mm. um, yeah, they're big. I would have to say that my own personal experience of having 33 children in a class not being an issue if you're well supported. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'm teaching 20 children at the moment and we don't have the resources within the school uh, to, to offer support to uh, some of the learners in my class. They're supported by me and by parents and volunteers and in many creative ways that our school are developing, but we would obviously be much happier to have core support staff supporting those learners' yeah. needs. Thank you for that. I wonder if Ian Menzies could tell me one school inspection report that, that demonstrates that that's an issue in Scottish education. Um, in terms of the, the, the staffing, the, the, um, the I'm, not from, I'm not from the inspection side. I've got some you know, information in terms of what we're seeing in terms of STEM, and also I can talk about the gender balance and equality so aspect. So teaching STEM has never been flagged up in an inspection report that you're aware of because of the exact pressure that Susan Boyd and thousands of teachers across Scotland report. I can tell you the you know we are seeing positive progress being made that's as not I what said. I asked. Yeah. That's not what I asked. Could you answer the question? As I say, I'm not an inspector, but you know, if, if you want that information, I can send but that you're in a charge later of STEM. You just explained to Jenny Galruth, you're in charge of STEM for Education Scotland, but you're not um, aware of any of this being flagged up as an issue. Um, we can send that information at a later day. What I'm saying you're is we're, we're seeing we're seeing progress, do you know, in terms of STEM. It's not what I asked. It's not what I asked. Andrew, do you have any any context on this one? Um, I, well, in terms of the additional support for the learning point that um, the Susan will write to, I think um, the Cabinet Secretary is committed to a review of additional support for learning. That yeah. came up in... Uh, no, indeed, so, that's very welcome. So, so that will come around that. Yeah. Um, and I'm also aware around um, the increases of teacher numbers that have been taking over previous years. I mean, I think in particular there's more primary school teachers than there have been any time since, um, since some time ago, since uh, I think... 1980. So there are rises there. I That's don't not the point Susan Boyd was making. She was making the point about support in schools for teachers in I, primary classes. I absolutely classes. appreciate that, and, and I've made the comment around the, the, the support element of that, that okay. it is something okay. that ministers have committed to look at. Susan, can I just go back to the, to the point you were making earlier on about your union submission in relation to initiatives? Because it very helpfully sets out, well, I can count five, but I was also thinking about languages in primary schools as well. So I can think of six initiatives that you as a primary school and Elizabeth as a primary school te uh, primary teacher are being asked to, um, to, as it were, implement, if that's the right expression. Um, do, do you get a sense or are you given guidance as to what's the most important initiative? Where, how do these initiatives... I mean, I don't envy you at all. This looks impossible to me, because they're all really valuable. Don't, I, I get that, but what's more important? Or are you given guidance as to what is more important? Well, I think that in my staff survey, one of the, one of the feedback comments, and although it was anonymous, you know, obviously I, I know staff handwriting, yes. so yes. I know who, who wrote yes. this. Anyway, uh, but one of, was the question of balance. And even though I'm passionate about STEM, I, I would have to agree that there has to be balance because that's what we all want yeah. uh, uh, for our children. And I think what the NESUWT and, and, uh, mm. uh, uh, and other unions and, and, and members are, are highlighting is that, of course, we know that literacy and numeracy are, are hugely important. And health and well-being, um, to be frank with you, you know, with the needs in my personal mm. class mm. at the moment, you know, I probably spent five months almost exclusively teaching yeah. literacy, numeracy and health and well-being. Um, you know, but that was what that specific class needed and that was because of the support that I, I had within the school. Mm. But now I've got more opportunities in, in the final weeks and, and months of the, the term to, to enrich the curriculum with a variety of other subjects. Mm. So these initiatives, we are aware of them all and we are all trying to balance them. Okay, thank you, it's very fair. Um, yeah, I mean, initiatives, exactly, we're all trying to achieve balance, but in individual authorities, there are different priorities. I mean, we have the, the National Improvement Framework that comes down, and then each authority, I'm sure you know this, makes their own quality improvement plan, and then each head teacher, you know, each cluster sometimes, and then each head teacher. And then, yeah. So it, it, the actual staff on the ground do then input into their own kind of quality improvement, certainly in early learning and childcare, and that will come from a combination of all these factors, of what the government is saying, what practitioners are saying, and then we in early learning childcare, what the, what the children need, what that cohort need, what that community yeah. needs at that time, and there how we, as professionals, I believe, try and balance 
all the things yeah. coming at us. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you one other question about your own submission? Yeah. Um, because you made a very good point about um, taking children outside, outside the school and into, into the wider world. I mean, I come from a farming background, and when I was still farming, long before I was in politics, we used to have primary school classes all the time at lambing time, and they would come and they would pick up lumps of silage, and, you know, they'd learn about why we, why we put, um, put fertiliser on a field because the grass grew and all that kind of stuff. We don't get that now. And you make a very important point in your submission about, about uh, teachers and, I suppose, you're hinting local authorities here, um, trend towards this being solely about risk rather than learning about our world and the world. Would you want to just add to that? Because yeah. I so agree with that point. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm happy to add to that. I think that and the learning sustainability uh, is kind of the background that I, I come with from this angle. Um, I feel some, again, some of the policies like... Care Inspectorate, for example, put My World Outdoors out recently for a little check, well, not recently, a couple of years ago now, and it's all about getting the kids outdoors. Yeah. And for a long time, that has been the priority because for some reason, we went very into our yeah. schools, into the playground and into the classrooms. So there's been a big push to get everybody out again, which is fantastic. Yeah. But with that push, there became a big slant, in my opinion, on risky play. And the Care Inspectorate, again, because of their own perception, people perceived that they didn't like risk. So that's probably why they had to push this big. We love risk, be risky, it's great, and everything. But because of that, I feel that a lot of staff in early learning and, and some of the primary think that going to a forest is the most important thing and experiencing risky play. And I think we need a shift back to, actually, it's about learning about our world through our world and that they're real contextual experiences. Mm. So it's all well and good going to a forest, and I think forests are wonderful, but if you live in um, Mayfield, for example, in Dalkeith, that isn't your reality no. on a daily basis or your community. Mm. So for me, going out into a local green space or even not a green space, if you don't have a green space around you, there's nothing worse than being made to feel like that's then, you know, that's detrimental to your health or your well-being, you know. So yeah. we need to go out and help these people love the communities that they're in and experience the world exactly. around them, yeah. okay. I think. And are there some practical things that you'd like to see done as a teacher which would help that to happen? Well, I think more... You mentioned the care commissioners. Is it them and some other agencies yeah, that need I mean, to do a bit more? Yeah, and I mean, they also recently brought out um, a document called Out to Play, um, which is a kind of step further on from that. And that does give more practical guidance about getting children out. And within that, I was pleased to see there was references to, to sustainability, to learning about the little things, you know, when you're outside and, and embracing that. So I think it hopefully is slowly coming, coming in. Um, but teachers are in my experience, still afraid to take children out. They're afraid to leave the classroom. They're even afraid to go into the playground because, to be honest, with some of the, the, the points Susan's made, if you don't have that support with you and you have a class yeah. of 30 children and you have children that, for whatever reason, might present distressed behaviours, you know, as a teacher, you're not probably going to go to a farm unless you have a lot of support Absolutely. because you can't guarantee everybody's safety no. is the reality. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Did you want back in? Yeah, so just to make a point, just to, you know, um, in terms of Education Scotland's view, you know, learning for sustainability, for instance, in STEM, you know, shouldn't be viewed as initiatives. Uh, learning for sustainability is an entitlement within the curriculum. Uh, we know the young people, as we've just heard from Elizabeth, are really passionate about getting outdoors, exploring, getting to know the world. We've seen that, for instance, recently, you know, with young people's passion about climate change and reducing plastic within their schools. Uh, STEM as well is not an initiative, it's a context for learning which gives uh, learners a chance to apply their learning in meaningful and engaging contexts. You know, I'm really privileged to get a chance to visit schools around Scotland and what I really see with STEM is not a sense of this being a burden but just the energy and enthusiasm that comes from that and I think that comes through in a lot of the submissions and you know, the, you know, the hearing or the information we've had today. So. STEM is a really enga engaging, exciting, meaningful context for, for young people. So what learning. is Education Scotland doing to break down these barriers that teachers face in terms of risk? Um, one of the things we're doing in partnership with the uh, Scottish Government is a Getting Out There resource, which is online, developed in partnership with uh, the Scottish Association Providers of Outdoor Education. So it gives them support in terms of getting out there, managing risk, uh, risk assessments and so on. So that's a really practical way that we're doing that. So giving them some guidance is what you've done. Guidance, support, how to manage risk assessments, how to you know visit places like farms and uh, forests. You know, but not forest give Susan Boyd the support she needs, which is extra assistance in her class to get those kids out of school. Well, that was one of the one of the things we did with the new raise officer team came in post, and we're actually going to be doing this with our STEM team as well, as we actually provide them with training in outdoor learning and taking STEM outdoors, so they can provide that support locally, to clusters, to schools, to practitioners, and within the regions. Okay, thank you.
Um, yes, Ms. Boyd. Um, I wanted to kind of pick up on, on some points that had come up during the discussion there. Um, risk, absolutely. Um, you know, risk assessments are part of the growing workload that <laughs> uh, um, it, it does hold us back in delivering all areas of the curriculum, and STEM is included in that, because a lot of our STEM experiences are outdoors, and for that we do have to go online and fill in risk assessments and, and spend time I I involved in that. And uh, uh, so, you know, that very nicely, you know, one of my big challenges here is workload. And although there has been working groups on reducing teacher workload, what I would say is that my experience is that those recommendations are wonderful, but local authorities aren't necessarily implementing those. And, um, you know, that is a huge pressure on delivering any valuable learning and teaching, but especially STEM. Thank you very much. Uh, can I thank all the panel uh, this morning for the attendance at committee? Um, our um, deliberations will continue next week and I now suspend and move into private session.